Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Oh, we're going to be travelling in time and space today, Richard. Hello, Maynard. Uh, did you like my... Oh, I think the TARDIS is taking off again. Oh, it's back. No, no. I'm, I'm glad we've uh, managed to land here in uh, the ABC building in Sydney, Maynard, for this uh, episode of The Skeptic Zone, episode number 252. We are in Ultimo at the Doctor Who exhibit, which is looking at 50 years of Doctor Who. We've got a uh, actual life-size plywood TARDIS in front of us here, looking fantastic. It's, it's really nice to see a full-size TARDIS, one that makes the right noise. Mm. I'm almost expecting it to ter- uh, dematerialise. <laughs> almost. And, and, and what's coming up on the show today, Richard? Well, we've got... We, you you and I are going to have a little look around this exhibition and discuss some Doctor Who things for our uh, Skeptic Zone Doctor Who type fans out there. Look, I've got some controversial things to say, particularly about someone known as the unpopular Doctor Who I looked up. Oh, yeah. I can't but, wait for that. But more about that later. But what else has been going on in the sceptical world? Well, just in this past week, um, Ian Bryce from the Australian Skeptics and I, who do the Mystery Investigators, along with Dr. Rachie, uh, well, it was, this time it was Ian Bryce and I, we went to the Australian Museum and we interviewed lots of science uh, educators and people doing science outreach um, for school students. That's coming up on the show. We also have uh, the Week in Science from the Royal Institution of Australia. Oh, what a great little segment that is. And we have a bit written by a, uh, a Victorian skeptic by the name of Mal Vickers all about Psychic Sally. Ah, ah. now is that the uh, English Psychic Sally? Yes. There might be other psychic sallies out there, but this one is about the English one who was uh, recently in Australia. Oh. There's a little kid over there attacking a Dalek. I don't know what he's getting into. I, I don't think it's going to end well for the kid or, or the Dalek. Or the Dalek, that's right. <laughs> so, yes, a, a bit about um, his thoughts on psychic Sally coming up. Episode 252. I tell you what, let's get stuck into the show and we'll come back after the first segment and we'll, uh, we'll have a talk to this Dalek. you can hear folks it's a combined sound of hundreds of students here high school students at the Australian Museum here to enjoy science week there are volunteers here with real live Australian lizards like blue tongues and so on there's um oh I'm standing right near a stuffed koala there you go there's a stuffed wombat on the other side but just so many school students here to enjoy the exhibitions and exhibits and information booths for science I'm here with my good friend Ian Bryce to perform the Mystery Investigators a bit later on. Oh, I'm being surrounded by, whoops, sorry, hundreds of students at the moment. We're all going off somewhere. It's a really, uh, it's really uplifting to see so many kids here, so many school students here to uh, find out more about science. So I think I might wander around to one of the exhibition rooms where there are information booths set up. Right. Uh, what have we got here? We've got uh, energy, we've got uh, Ansto people are here, we have people demonstrating all sorts of things, youth robotics, biological sciences, the Australian Museum themselves have uh, a little stand here, Janolan Caves, jams, jams, oh I like the sound of that, I like jam, which doesn't really mean jam does it, hello. Hello, nice and who, to meet you. Thank Rebecca. you. Who, hello, Rebecca. You're from Jams. Does that mean you make jams or what's the story? We have um, a series of talks once a month, um, basically on the theme of microbiology. So what we're here for today is to get people thinking about things at a much smaller scale. And Jam stands for? Joint Academic Microbiology Seminars. I, so like, I like it. Jams. I like that. And l- let's look at the table here. We've got a microscope set up looks great. We've got a little landscape here with kangaroos. Yeah, this is where you want to start. So this is looking at what people think of when they think what is living in their back garden. You can see the 
um, dogs and wallabies and things. And but we're getting people to think about things at a much smaller level. Yeah. So in the microscope here, we've got um, basically some moss suspension. There's something wiggly in there. And it's connected to um, our laptop here. And you can see some nematodes and different things moving around. So you can see it's quite dynamic. I just peered through the microscope instead of looking at the laptop, which I should have done. But as soon as I peered through, there was, oh, there's another one. I'm seeing these tiny little transparent creatures slithering across the screen. That's quite something. Yeah, so that's, um, we have a couple of samples people can come through and look at. Um, and, yeah, see on the screen that things are moving and there's a, a, um, a lot of small um, microbes when yeah. you're looking at a bigger structure. And that's what you're looking at over here as well with the mushrooms. You're looking at this, um, what you can see on top and, a, and that there's a lot more when you look up. Oh, up. wow, there's a whole little bed of mushrooms here, but the side's being cut away. It's like a cross-section. And I can look right down into the dirt here, into the earth, and see their... Root, so, yeah, root structure. You can see the structure down here, and this is um, our comparison is like an apple tree. That this is basically the tree with the roots on top. So when you see mushrooms growing on top, that's just a small bit. I of had no structure. idea. That's quite and amazing. Then we have another form of microscope here that you can basically zoom in and look at the things on our table here. We've got a sponge. We've got some coral. And we've got some different fungi, some of it growing on agar plates and some, you know, your button mushrooms like you're used to seeing. Well, this is just like you see on TV. There's an agar plate with penicillin, it says, growing on it. It's just like those growths you see on those uh, crime shows or the Mythbusters when they smear things. It is. And sometimes you can see, not on this one at the moment, the little droplets that are formed on the top. Wow. Gems. Oh, okay. What microbe are you? There's little booklets. Now, this, this is, is all... a little survey that we're doing. Yeah. So this is what microbe are you? We've got this booklet, and it's asking you different questions. Do you like to be outdoors? Do you like <laughs> being in a group? Um, is your hair all over the place? That's um, a yes to me today. And then when you get to the end, you can identify which microbe you are. I haven't identified who I am yet. No, I, don't know what, I don't know what I am. you it on the side. I see. Um, Here's Helobacterium salarium, which is one of the things that I look at. So you could, um, we're going to see what is most popular today. And in front of you, we have a little basket of toy microbes. We Germs do. and things, are they? <laughs> Some of the things that you may be when you've worked out what microbe you are, um, are found in our basket. So <laughs> here we have some salmonella. Um, oh, nice so cute. A nice furry version um, and some yeast um, and different things like that. Well, what an interesting display, and I'm, I'm lucky I'm just sort of between the waves of school children that come yes. by, aren't I? There are but, some um, heading now. Our furry ones here, what they do show you is that microbes are very different. They're not just small and um, similar shaped, but you can see the variety that exists and the different structures that they have on them. Oh, I love looking at this monitor here with the microscope, and we can see them actually moving in their little environment. Oh, wow. It's like a multi faceted one there and a quick swimming one there. What an interesting thing and the kids enjoying it I hope. They are yeah it's been pretty busy the last two days Fantastic. Rebecca thank you for uh, uh, giving me a little bit of your time to talk about Jams and the website folks to learn more about Jams is jams.org.au Yes and we meet in the museum once a month so people can come to the seminars here Well I'm walking around the corner here with lots of students in the far side and I've just noticed this very interesting looking thing from the uh, New South Wales Institute of Sport. There's a lovely young lady now with funny sort of pads on her feet. She's standing on this long board and what are you doing? Uh, so this is called a slide board and I'm simulating ice skating, working on my skating stride. And off she goes. A little demonstration for She's you. from side to side to back again and your body... Uh, motion is exactly what, what we you see would be doing on the ice. On the ice, exactly. But you're not going forward; you're going from side to side. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, it's a little bit limited on on the ice. Your feet would be going backwards a little bit, so on an angle. Um, this one, it's really just working on the skating muscles and just improving on the stride. So, you're a better skater when you do get on the ice. All right. So, if you do that for um, long enough, and she's still doing it, folks. She's quite keen. <laughs> if you do that for long enough, when you get on the ice. Your muscles are more... Uh, well, you've worked on you've those worked skating on muscles. For, you've, you've developed those skating muscles um, 
just getting them ready for when you're on the ice, it's obviously a lot different to running, so you do have slightly different muscles that are being worked out. Is that quite a workout you're doing there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I am an ice hockey player, so and even this is still hard for me. <laughs> How popular is ice hockey in uh, Australia? Oh, I'll promote it while I'm at it. So Go for it. We've got um, probably around 4,000 members across Australia. So, I mean, it, it is popular. There's always plenty of room for growth. We've... Um, we have ice rinks in pretty much all the states around the country. New South Wales has the most. I think we've got about six or seven, um, all the way up to Coffs Harbour even. There's one near me, in fact, at um, uh, Campsy or... Canterbury. Canterbury, yes. That's my home rink. I was there last night. I'll be there tomorrow night as well. Canterbury rink. I go there occasionally, take my nieces and nephews. They love it, yes. So all you need to give them is a hockey stick and teach them how to play hockey. I can teach them that. I coach. <laughs> when I was a very small boy, I, I lived in Canada. And ah. my first pair of skates were double bladed. Yep. And I used yep. to go with my giant That's hockey how they stick. All are, yeah. And pushing a and push, pushing a chair around as well. And then we used to, <laughs> uh, we used to we lived in a little country area and we used to go and play curling too. Oh nice. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a funny video of me running around with a big broom on the curling rink, you know, about four years old or something. Just sweeping the ice yes. as you go. <laughs> so um, if people want to know more about uh, hockey, ice hockey, where can they go? What's the website? Um, easiest thing to do is to go to iha.org.au. That's um, the Ice Hockey Australia's website. And if you go, uh, I'm sure it has state associations listed there. You go to them, it'll have all the contact details. Or just look it up on, on Facebook. Again, it'll be Ice Hockey Australia. If you are in New South Wales, Ice Hockey New South Wales does have their own Facebook page as well. Cool. And for the New South Wales Institute of Sport, where do we go? For the New South Wales Institute of Sport, uh, we have a Facebook, we have a Twitter, we also have a YouTube account, um, and our website is www.nswis.com.au. And your name is? Sarah. Sarah, thank you very much. Thank you. To give you a little bit of oh, a flavour of what this is like, there's 20, 30, 40 school students young ladies as it happens uh, from high school running around at the moment doing all sorts of experiments which is really great to see getting information about young scientists or uh, physics outreach electricity hello again I'm just an, an, an old friend and I'm just here doing some uh, reports for the Skeptic Zone podcast and where are you from? I am from the University of New South Wales I've just finished my master in magnetism research for data storage. Oh, ah, I, I understand, right. Yeah, and so hard drives. Hard drives. And you have some experiments here today for the kids to enjoy? We do, certainly. Let's step over to the experiment bench. We'll step. Oh, it's another bench. Oh, ah, hello. Is my, is my little recording device safe around these? I hope so. <laughs> wow, it's got lots of... Um, it's a battery there, a big magnet. Uh, what is this strange device? It's a pendulum of some... It's if you like roller coasters. Do you like roller coasters? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, on roller coasters, they have a sneaky way to keep you safe, even if you don't know it. And it's used by magnets. So this experiment is called electromagnetic braking. Is that the... Um, oh, braking. I thought it was the harness. No, the braking. No, the braking. Oh. Braking. So if you just lift up this here... Yeah. Um, And so we're lifting up a little pendulum. Yes, it's lifting up. we're going to swing it between two solenoids. And we're not going to touch either one of the solenoids. So if you just let go... Swinging back and forth and back and forth. And then if we come around the other side and hold the button down... Yeah. I'm walking around here and I'm going to press this button. Oh! And now we watch the pendulum. It's coming to a grinding halt. Look at that. So what's happened is by pressing the button, we've simply made current go through two solenoids. And so those solenoids produce uh, a magnetic field. And our piece of our pendulum so is simply a piece of aluminium. And when that aluminium comes close to the magnetic field, it sees a changing magnetic field because it's becoming closer and closer. And the magnetic field induces little circular currents in the aluminium and circular current induces a magnetic field and Lenz's law said those two oppose and that's why it breaks. Good heavens. And it did. Yeah, it, 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 didn't, yeah. it didn't come to a screeching halt but within a few swings it was stopping. That's quite interesting. Yeah. So yeah. if you have a larger magnet yeah. and aka large, a larger amount of voltage to put through our solenoids then that could come to a grinding halt very easily. I, it, it certainly could. Now what is this strange tube? It's quite tall. It's got two wires sticking up through it. It's all encased in perspex. 
So what this is is called a Crookes tube or plasma cannon. A plasma cannon, I like that. Sounds way better, I know. <laughs> so if we press the little green button here. Oh, a little green button. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bound to press a little green button. <laughs> All right. Oh. Yeah. Well, folks, you know those old Frankenstein movies where you see the arc of light traveling up the two, uh, two metal rods? That's what I'm looking at right now. Wow. So the what's happening is when you press the button, 25,000 volts what? allow electrons to jump from <laughs> one piece of metal and smash into molecules in the air and then jump into the other piece of metal. And so when we press the button, we only ever see one piece of light going up at a time. And so the light is white because it's smashing into these molecules. And we only ever see one because the electrons want to travel in the path of least resistance. And so instead of jumping into the air around the arc, it wants to keep going through the arc because that acts as a channel where they can easily jump through. That's, I've never seen one so close before. But I'm looking at the reaction on the surface of each of the metal bars. That's quite something. Wow, what fun. Yes. you call this a job? I love this job. <laughs> <laughs> now, if people want to find out more, where can they contact you or find out more? They can go to www.outreach.phys.unsw.edu.au. We also do public talks, liquid nitrogen workshops, and other fun events. Sounds too good to be true, folks. A career in science, it's got to be for you, right? Physics. Physics. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, your name was? Nicole Reynolds. Nicole, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. What else do we have here? Beyond zero emissions, looks interesting, solar energy, and hello, we have another stand here. Hello, sir, who are you? <laughs> I'm Katan Joshi from Infogen Energy. And uh, there's a uh, wind turbine in the back of your uh, exhibition here. Yes, there is. Um, it's actually a powered wind turbine. Um, but this morning I attached a power meter to our exhibition stall and it's all consuming about 100 watts. So it's not consuming a lot of power, which is good. Hello, this is interesting. We've got a little solar cell set up here attached to a tiny little fan. Yes, I popped by a J car this morning <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Um, it's, I don't suspect that is generating a lot, probably in the milliwatt range, but it's, it's, enough to make it's that a good demo. demonstration. Yeah, yeah and uh, that I actually, uh, you can. I've got a little fan on the solar panel. The fan can power a little wind generator down here. Um, I'm still waiting on a, a little mounty thing to get it working, but it's cool to see solar power powering a fan, which powers a wind turbine. And makes a little guy on the top spin. Now, you had an article in the most recent issue of the, the Skeptic magazine, the journal from Australian Skeptics. What was that about? Uh, that article was about um, a, a disease called wind turbine syndrome that's been obviously attributed to people living near wind turbines. Now, the article itself was about how people can come up with a conclusion and then start investigating it so basically, whatever they find, it's going to support their conclusion. And I think wind turbine syndrome is a good example of that. Yeah, we see that a lot in, in the sceptical circles. People start with the conclusion, then they'll look for all the supporting evidence instead of looking at the evidence and seeing where that leads. Exactly right. Um, and uh, it's pretty astonishing with, with wind turbine syndrome. The lady who first investigating it, investigated it, Nina Pierpont, um, quite literally states that before she began her research she had already decided that it was real um, and I really expected to kind of have to work a bit harder um, and dig into the archives a little bit but the first thing I found was her stating I had decided that this was real I began interviewing patients and published my research so it's pretty astonishing it's very stark now you can read all about that folks in the latest issue of the Skeptic magazine I think we're going to have to cut this short because the floodgates have opened <laughs> There are hundreds of kids just <laughs> pouring through the door. I've never... Yes. We're both being swept away right now. We We're really just, are. Yeah. So I better let you get on with it. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Did you see that UFO sighting that made the news? What did that latest study about alternative treatments really say? Is this photo making the rounds real or a hoax? 
Doubtful News is a unique website featuring news about pseudoscience, the paranormal, anomalies, and questionable claims framed with a skeptical view. Come visit doubtfulnews.com every day for news about cryptozoology, conspiracies, shams, scams, and more. Follow us on Twitter at Doubtful News. Critical thinking is essential in assessing today's news. Doubtful News helps you decide, can you really believe this stuff? We're here at the ABC foyer in Ultimo, where the 50 Years of Doctor Who exhibition is going on, and it's on every day between 10 and 4, I believe it is. Uh, Come along and have a look. It's absolutely free to have a wander through, and we're here right in front of a Dalek. It's a real Dalek. Look at that. I have seen real Daleks from time to time. Uh, QED conference in Manchester, a, a real Dalek normally turns up, but here's one in Sydney. Look, the most frightening ever... Bad, bad guy, bad person, bad thing on Doctor Who was not the Daleks, not the Solar. The Weeping Angels are up there, but I think there was a John Pertwee episode where there was a beanbag that ate people. They had this plastics factory. Unit got involved with the whole thing. Uh, Lethbridge Stewart was involved. That sounds like the Autons. It, it, could, it, it could have been, but they had a, this guy, they said, oh, please sit on our beanbag, and the beanbag just ate him, swallowed him up. How I, dangerous is that? I remember that, and if we look behind us here, there's a huge wall of Doctor Who, which sort of charts all the years and major um, points in this. There are panels everywhere. So a victory to the Daleks over there, a Christmas invasion yeah, Daleks. And, and you have a look, and it, it, yeah. it says the reason why the Doctor has regenerated at various times throughout the series. But, but the Tom Baker one would have to be one of the lamest of them all. It says the Doctor regenerates after a fall. What, does he have a bad hip or something? He does. He was getting old a bit and he fell off his... No, he fell from a... Um, he fell from a radio telescope, I seem to remember. I, I'm sure it was, it was a big fall. But also there's ones here too, why various people, uh, why various partners decide to leave. You can find out why any of his companions decide to leave. And there's one of them here, Romana. Romana elects to leave the TARDIS to fight slavery in e-space. Now, she could have gone and fought <laughs> slavery on eBay. That would yes. have been much more effective. Yes, that's right. Or... Um E-space. You've got to wonder about E-space, don't you? What do yeah. they do in E-space? Particularly in 1981. Yeah. Oh, yes. Very dodgy. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Actually, what is your favourite episode of uh, Doctor Who ever? Have you got one? Oh, n- no, no, of course not. Because when I started watching it, it was way back in the very early 70s in Australia when we had Patrick Troughton. Uh, and I remember those very well. But I was very, very fond of uh, John Pertwee's Doctor. And I think um, some of those stories, The Green Death, I remember quite well. Look, I actually take some. No- I took some notes on this because I thought, look, if I'm going, I'm, I'm not really a Whovian all that much. I had to listen to the Doctor Who podcast, which I would recommend. It's simply called the Doctor Who podcast. Oh, yeah. They were saying some interesting stuff, but I think my favourite episode would have to be Carnival of Monsters. I'm, I had to look it up because John Pertwee. Yes, because, because because they were talking about Voyage of the Damned, and that's the one that Kylie was on, and that made me think of the ship that they were on. And I thought, hang on a minute, Voyage of the Damned, which is a machine that had monsters and boats and things, and John Pertwee gets trapped in there, and all the monsters and the boats and everything get mixed up. And, Ooh, and uh, I, yes, I remember that. I, I, but it just occurred to me one of my all-time favourites would have to be either the Mask of Mandragora or the one where the Doctor was more or less a Sherlock Holmes character. It was in the ba- Tom Baker era, and the name just eludes me for the moment, The Talons of Wang Chang. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, you're right. Giant rats. Yes, yes. It was, it, was set, it was set in Jack the Ripper London. That's right, and he was virtually a Sherlock Holmes character. That was a great episode, a great uh, adventure. Uh-huh. Well, and, and as you look here on the board, you can see that, the, of course, there's that big gap where they just did a movie in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. We were all worried it wouldn't come back, and then suddenly... We heard rumours, and before we knew it, it came back. It was great. Isn't it great that Matt Smith has been able to bring back the popularity of the fez? We Look, yep. see that young lady down there? There's a girl wearing a fez wearing here. Wearing a fez. And pretty much at any, any con you go now, there's always someone with a red fez. I think it's, uh, it's marvellous. I wonder what the new Doctor will bring back. Well, well, let's have a bit further look down here. to A Week in Science from R.I. Oz, bringing you the science news you need to know. This Week in Science saw brain activity after death, language affecting vision, and heart trouble? There's an app for that. US researchers have used rats to investigate near-death experiences. 
the rats displayed a big surge of brain activity immediately after cardiac arrest. That's after their heart stopped beating and blood stopped flowing to the brain. Around 20% of human cardiac arrest survivors report having a near-death experience, such as visions, potentially stemming from residual brain activity close to death. The researchers said their study provides the first scientific framework for these near-death experiences. Have you ever wondered why females are so preoccupied with elaborate male displays? Many male animals have bright colours, big antlers, long plumage and other features that attract females, but we haven't really understood why it turns them on. A new theory this week suggests that females use the displays as an indicator of genetic compatibility, particularly the genes involved in producing healthy offspring. So the old adage appears to be true. It's really what's on the inside that counts. You're listening to A Week in Science from RIOZ, and now, four science headlines in 30 seconds. The discovery of the oldest Neanderthal bone tools in Europe suggests that they were less influenced by modern humans than we thought. A new window can selectively block heat and visible light by applying specific voltages to glass. A revolutionary iPhone app and special case can quickly and cheaply detect heart rhythm problems, potentially preventing strokes. And hearing a word of an otherwise invisible object can help you to see it. Last week, we asked you how do dolphins recognise their buddies after 20 years? It's by their whistles. The link to the paper is on our website. That's it for this Week in Science. For more information on these stories and other science news, go to the RIOS website, riaus.org.au. Follow us on Twitter using the hashtag WeekInSci. I'm Paul Willis, and I'll catch you next week. Hey, guys. This is Jay from The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Whoa, 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 hold on. Whoa. <laughs> Everybody knows I'm the only reason to listen to the freaking show, right? I mean, if it was up to me, the show would start with this. Yeah, boy! Well, Rebecca would hate that, probably, but, I mean, I'd rock that. Listen to our show, and you can learn about cool stuff like a technological singularity, which is someday when technology progresses so fast that it would make the Industrial Revolution look like a kid's science project. Anyway, come check us out at www.theskepticsguide.org and get your science on! And here at the Doctor Who exhibit, there's some costumes as well. Now, this would be this would be David Tennant's suit we're looking at, wouldn't it? It certainly is, with the uh, the sneakers and the the sort of the brown and brown shirt with blue stripes, and, and the brown uh, uh, not shirt uh, uh, suit. Yes. And what's the first thing that strikes you looking at David Tennant's costume, if indeed that is actually David Tennant's costume, and not one that just knocked up? What's the thing that strikes you most about it? The tie. No. <laughs> the, how thin is he? Oh, how thin is he? Yes. yes. Well, it's, I, I like the tie, but you're right. It's it's a very thin uh, suit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, although, actually, when you get along there and you see Matt Smith's suit, he's even thinner than David Tennant's. Good grief. <laughs> you're probably right. And he had the braces, too, which I like. Mm. Which I like. Yeah. Yeah, of course, over there, we've got the companions wall as well with the large uh, companion photos there. Now, of course, oh, well, really... Um, one of the most popular for yeah, me was Leela when did, I was growing up. I think uh, Leela had a large effect on a lot of Tom Baker fans right. in, in many ways. In many ways, yes. Although under that, we've got Rose Tyler, of course, which had the... But she brought the whole family with her. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She got a uh, what is it? Season pass to the TARDIS and brought a whole family along. <laughs> mm. Look, and I've actually got the three reasons why I actually don't like Doctor Who. I do, but these would be three reasons why you wouldn't like Doctor Who. The episode "Let's Kill Hitler," the episode, oh, yeah. the episode, "The Doctor's Wife." Now, a lot of people oh, love that. I, don't, I didn't mind that. I no, didn't mind no, that. I didn't like that. I said, right. "Come on, enough of this emotional gunk." <laughs> and two, two more words. Third reason: River Song. Oh, come on. River Song? Everyone likes River Song, don't they? No, I'd like her completely taken out of the timeline. (laughs) (laughs) Listeners may have their own thoughts on that. Of course they do. That's why I like to be controversial. As we talk about the unpopular doctor. Now, the unpopular doctor... Now, I could be wrong about this. Well, there's a wall of doctors here. We can have a little look. The unpopular doctor, I believe... Now, a lot of people seem to think it might have been Peter Davidson because he was following Tom Baker, who was quite popular. But Peter Davidson did a pretty good job. I think Colin Baker is known as the unpopular doctor. Well, you know, I, I, I enjoyed his doctor. In fact, he's the only one I've met. 
Mm-hmm. The only uh, doctor I've met is, is uh, Colin Baker some years ago here in Sydney, and he was absolutely charming. And when I was when he was the doctor, it was my last two years of high school, which were particularly horrendous for me. And I would escape, you know, come home and watch Doctor Who to to escape the horrors of uh, my high school experience. So I've got a soft spot for Colin Baker. Well, well the reason that I, I mention him as unpopular is because I think he tried to do something different with the character. I think he might have even actually have tried to introduce a bit of the Doctor being a conflicted personality for the, almost the first time. And not and, always nice. And not always nice yeah. and, and maybe what, partial to a touch of Biff. And there he is. We're just seeing a video of him now on trial, in fact. Yeah, he, yeah. he, he had a, Well, I mean, the doctor's always got a touch of arrogance about him, but there you can see he's a he's, he's big, arrogant guy. I, I don't know if I really... I thought the costume was, was fun and interesting, but I don't know if it dates so well. <laughs> and, and something we also need to remind people about Doctor Who is... When has there been a male lead character of any particular run of any series who's been so non-violent? James Bond. No, I take that back. <laughs> well, well, you, you, I mean, look, to find a non-violent character yeah. uh, as much as Doctor Who, you'd have to go to the Gilmore Girls or something like that. He, he, he's been known to have a bit of a biffo, Doctor. He, he's, you know, uh, a vi, vin, a Venusian Jitsu or something, I remember. Yeah, but it's not his first resort. He never carries a gun. He's only got that sonic screwdriver, which occasionally worked, depending yeah. on whether he's charged it or yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, you're right, you're right. No, he, he tries to solve his problems in other ways. Now, now, how do you think Doctor Who sits as a sceptic? Because he does apply the scientific method, but yeah, I... in, inconsistently. Oh, very, very. But I, I like the fact that, that he's uh, a hero, and when I was a kid he was a hero for, for people like me, who was an intelligent man, solving problems with science and reason and, and you know, okay, a bit of action and adventure. But then, of course, the show slips into things like the paranormal and and uh, all this sort of stuff. But you know what? In that universe, you allow it. It's fantasy. It's fiction. Mm. But yeah, basically speaking, I think for science, I think he's a great character. He is someone who's always unconventional. He's always strange. He's always he's always, by definition, an outsider and unusual. But he seems to always know to do the right thing, even if he doesn't appear to do the right thing. He usually does. And I think there's something in that, in that, like, people that are, at, that are, that are weird do the right thing. He usually does the right thing. But, mm-hmm. I, I mean, the later Doctors, of course, they're the really conflicted ones, much more than the early ones, which is interesting, and why not? You know, well, the, well, the show well, has to evolve. Well, by the time you've got ten personalities preceding you, there's a chance that there could be you could be carrying a bit of baggage. <laughs> <laughs> a man is the sum of his memories, you know, a Time Lord even more so. Mm-hmm. From the pages of the Victorian Skeptics website, www.vicskeptics.wordpress.com. Another big psychic show rolls into town by Mal Vickers with assistance from Martin Hadley. Never has any psychic ever passed a rigorous scientific test of their claimed ability. While most skeptics are well aware of this, you'd think the media and society in general knew nothing of it. Imagine what kind of world it would be if, from tomorrow, psychics really did have the abilities they claim to possess. The prizes from the next lottery would go to a series of psychics, presumably in order of merit. Fairly soon, non-psychics would stop buying tickets and the lotteries would fold. There wouldn't be much point in casinos, bingo, or the horse races either. The world we inhabit isn't like that. We have lotteries and casinos that make a fortune, despite the presence of many psychics who travelled the world flaunting their talents. In July 2013, Australia played host to a visit from a prominent UK-based self-proclaimed psychic Sally Morgan. Sally did a number of shows across Australia. Her shows are big events, like those of John Edward and the late Doris Stokes. The Athenaeum Theatre in Melbourne, which hosted Sally Morgan, seats about a thousand people. The emphasis is on her supposed messages from the departed. These big psychic performances are not at all like the stereotypical local fair gypsy with her tent and crystal ball, whom you might pay a few dollars for a giggle. Yes, I know sceptics should always hold out hope that a real psychic may turn up one day, but for how long? For many years now, the Australian sceptics have offered $100,000 to anybody who can demonstrate a paranormal ability, including psychic ability. Even greater sums of money are on offer elsewhere in the world. Testing psychics can be quite straightforward. 
if a simple yet robust test protocol can be agreed upon. For example, many psychics claim to be able to do readings from photographs. A person might send a photograph of a deceased relative to a psychic, and the bereaved and the psychic would then hook up by a phone for a reading. The psychic would then typically claim to be using the photograph to help connect with the deceased, and would also typically claim not to be getting information from the bereaved relative. To test if this is true, exclude the relative from the test and pose this question to the psychic. Here are the photographs of some dearly departed. Would you please get in contact with the spirit world and ask them their names? Our phones remain steadfastly silent, despite the large sums of money on offer. And to those shopping mall or weekend market $20 psychics who don't necessarily do it for the money, we say, can you think of a charity that could use $100,000, courtesy of the Australian skeptics? In October 2011, Sally Morgan was asked publicly to take part in a test of her psychic abilities in the UK. The test protocol was put together by Chris French, a professor of psychology in the UK. Also on the test panel was science writer Simon Singh and members of the Merseyside Skeptic Society. On offer was one million US dollars. This was a serious offer. Who would want to pass up a million dollars? Sally could have kept the money herself or given it to charity. Sally Morgan's lawyers reportedly stated, You will know that we all have far more important things to do than to take part in this or any other test at this point. She will not attend at Liverpool or at any other time. Skeptics have investigated how to perform like a psychic. Their abilities can be imitated in many ways. The method that produces the best and most spectacular hits is known as hot reading. The performer uses information actually obtained from the subject before the reading start. Psychic performers have been caught obtaining information through questionnaires, conversations with the audience members before the show, and even from the internet. Cold reading is where the performer uses a variety of skills after the reading has started to discreetly get information straight from the subject or to get agreement from the subject to various careful suggestions. Done cleverly, the performer appears to be getting information through psychic skills. Cold reading can work well or not so well, but compared to hot reading, it has always had the advantage that the performer cannot be busted. Techniques include shrewd observation of the subject. What demographic is the subject? Age? How are they dressed? Why would they be here at a psychic show? You could go fishing for clues. You ask questions that don't sound like obvious questions. Does this make sense to you? Therefore, the subject will help you. They believe in psychic abilities. They'll unknowingly provide you with the answers. There are also statements that cover all bases. The Rainbow Rouge, for example. Your father was at times cold, but you knew his warm side. He was, in fact, both cold and warm, like most people. You've covered all the bases and everything in between. The subject will smile and agree. What's also important is the perception of the audience. People will naturally remember the hits and forget the misses. For example, wow, wasn't it amazing how the psychic knew your father was such a warm, friendly person? The comment about him also being cold is forgotten. This is just a very quick look at the big subject of cold reading. There is an excellent book available on the methods of cold reading by Ian Rowland, the full facts book of cold reading. Such people as Ian and local skeptic Lynn Kelly have shown how intelligence, empathy and practice can allow any person to demonstrate apparent psychic powers. Lynn has amazed believers with the accuracy of her readings, only to confess to them later on that she was a fake. You can guess how good she is from the fact that customers have told her many times that she really does have psychic powers. It's just that she does not realize it herself. Some rational thinkers accept what psychics do with a kind of paternalistic justification. Oh well, those that believe in that kind of thing sometimes need closure with departed loved ones, so why not let them have it? I'm not a fan of this apologetic thinking. Would it perhaps be better if the people sought help from a professional grief counsellor? A grief counsellor should be capable of giving people 
the same kind of help. If you argue that only psychics can offer benefit to grieving people, then how does that compare with the harm that might be caused? There are many documented cases where psychics have caused harm. On the What's the Harm website, there are accounts of a lady who lost her life savings to a psychic slash con artist, and the child who died because a psychic slash healer convinced her parents to change her medication. The parents of a missing child were told that their child was dead. Four years later, he was found alive. The long list of loss of wealth, health, and in some cases life is worth a read by anyone who may think psychics do no harm. To be fair, these problems aren't always caused by the big-name psychic performers. Typically, promoters of the big touring psychic shows will try to market them to the media. TV snippets of the psychic's performances appear to focus on close relatives of people who have died. Take a look at Sally Morgan's promotional video on YouTube. Audience members who are called to stand up for a public reading look and sound quite distressed, particularly when Sally voices the deceased. What is really strange is how the most prominent psychics and high-earning psychics have a disclaimer that they are only entertainers. When self-proclaimed psychic John Edwards' television show Crossing Over aired on Australian TV, one might have noticed at the very end of the credits and just for three seconds, a text disclaimer. It states in part, The producer has relied heavily on contributions of John Edward and other third parties in the creation of this program, which has been produced for entertainment purposes only. Sally Morgan used a similar disclaimer for her Australian shows. Sally Morgan is an experimental slash investigational. There are no guaranteed or certain results, and the show is for the purposes of entertainment. So it's all just for entertainment. I have a hard time reconciling that with the claims of psychic abilities. In Sally Morgan's promotional video, she says, You know, when you think about it, these messages, where are they coming from? The ether, as they say. One generally expects professional people to be able to do what they claim. Motor mechanics fix cars, bankers borrow and lend money, cabinet makers make cabinets and so on. However, psychics have never been able to show under carefully controlled conditions that they are indeed psychic. I'm yet to find a motor mechanic who fixes cars for entertainment purposes only. Perhaps there are some that do? Shrug. My motor mechanic whistles sometimes, but I digress. Have I missed something here? Is it ethical to use the relatives of people who have died to market entertainment? Thank you, Mal Vickers, with assistance from Martin Hadley, for writing that report. Again, you can read more from Victorian Skeptics at vicskeptics.wordpress.com. Have you heard the one about how the Illuminati, in conjunction with the US government, are hiding the existence of aliens in order to ensure the supply of helium is kept low? Or that the CIA, the militant wing of the Freemasons, are working with the elders of Zion to take control of the population of the world through fluoridated chemtrails? Canberra Skeptics Incorporated, on behalf of the Shadow Government, will be massing an array of dark forces for the Australian Skeptics National Convention 2013. This convention has conspired to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, possibly the most famous conspiracy theory of all time. If you've ever wanted to learn about the truth behind the death of JFK, what makes for a good conspiracy theory and why they are so prevalent, Canberra Skeptics invites you to attend. That is, of course, should you choose to accept it. Come to nationalskepticsconvention.org and just remember, they will be watching you. We've come to the end of the Doctor Who exhibition here at ABC Ultimo. We've almost gone into ABC News 24. I might go down there and do a bit of, do a bit of, do a bit of broadcasting. I think you should, mean I'd, yeah. Now, we were trying to sit in the background and pull faces and everything, but they actually changed, They actually blue-screen the window out so that people can't be seen in the background. What That's a, a pity. pity. I just wanted to go down there and pull faces. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Now, we're actually in front of some of the masks of some of the bad, the evil people here at Doctor Who, and this is a, a rather innocuous-looking piece of plastic and fibreglass here, but this actually scared the kapoopy out of you as a kid. Yeah, when I was a kid, forget the, the pig monster here or the, the, the ood. I thought the Daleks were scary, but this one 
to me of all the Doctor Who thing, creatures, whatever, this one gave me the creeps more than anything else. It's a cyber mat. If anybody watches the uh, uh, early Tom Baker stuff, you'll see cyber mats. They're, they're, they're sort of like um, mechanical rats in a way, but they would leap on people and kill them. And that was a really scary thought because you could be sitting there eating your breakfast and this thing just rolls on the carpet behind you, jumps up, and before you know it... That was scary. Look, the, the Ood are pretty scary, but, like, it's no weeping angels. I mean, come on, a monster that, that, that comes up on you and all you got to do is look away or blink. <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. But, again, nowhere near as scary as the beanbag that eats you. You know, as a child, I couldn't sit down, sit on the beanbag for about three years. Another really early memory I have, just an early memory um, of television, is the episode of Doctor Who, and it's probably the same one, where somebody's talking on the telephone and the master is at the other end of the phone and he does something with the device and the phone cord attacks the person on the other end and wraps it around, and wraps around their neck. That was really scary. Yeah. Well, you just think he went to all that trouble and now he's been defeated by the invention of mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you with that. What the, you, no, mate, it's not, it's not working, mate. It's not going to happen. Yeah, what, what kind of master are you? That was scary. I, I, I admit, I was, I was scared by that, and I was scared by the Cybermat, but in a delightful way. Well, it's been a frightening episode here of the Skeptic Zone. <laughs> it certainly has. <laughs> and what have we got coming up on next week? Next week's Skeptic Zone. Well, you know what? It's like Doctor Who. It's a mystery. <laughs> I, 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 more of your uh, interviews with um, uh, Marlo... Cassetti. Ah, uh, the, man who, the man who worked for NASA and what NASA used to be before it was NASA. Early days of NASA. That's a really fascinating series of interviews. More of that coming up next week. Apart from that, uh, listeners, you'll just have to wait and see. We'll find out. We're going to have a bit of a look around. And if you could take one bit of the exhibition home, what would it be? For me, it's Kylie Minogue's outfit from Voyage of the Damned, but that, that's for incredibly personal reasons. <laughs> We're just walking up to that now. Well, look, over to our right, in a little glass box, we have Tom Baker's scarf. Mm. I think that would have to be it for me. Yeah, because I remember, didn't all you know, high school kids get into long scarves suddenly when Dom, Tom Baker came out? I had one. It curled a bit. It wasn't cr- quite the right sort, but I did have one. Well, let's take a journey in time and space and see you next time on The Skeptic Zone. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts and extra video reports.